So really, what would happen is this one's up here. This one, this one, and this one would actually be brown if the capital A is the dominant. And then this one would be blue. So what they're saying is if both of these parents have brown eyes, but they could have a blue-eyed child. But if both parents have dominant genes only, they'll only have brown-eyed kids. Or if both parents have the small A, the recessive, then they'll only have blue. Well, God put that in us so that we can, so animals can change, and so that we can uh, do all kinds of things. And it's amazing because this DNA that they always talk about, um, I, I mean, I, I don't know some of this for sure. I've just read stuff, but they said if you took all the information that's in DNA and you put it in books, it would stretch to the moon. I mean, the amount of information that's in that little strand is, is almost uncomprehensible. And uh, so there are things, what I'm trying to show you here, though, is there's things like hair color, uh, height, um, all kinds of different traits here, attitudes and stuff like that, that can change from person to person, or animal to animal. And so they can adapt. But there are things that can't change. For example, our eye. It doesn't matter what color hair you got, you still got two eyes and they're the same. And they're round. What amazes me of this whole thing, though, is in this DNA, it's just information. But like they have a lens there in the eye. Now the lens is made out of clear cells. How... Now, one cell doesn't know where it is in relation to another cell. I mean, how do they know to get in this, or there's thousands of cells in this little lens, how do they know to line up exactly right to make a lens? I mean, if it's off just a little bit, it's not going to work. And not only that, but then you have to have the whole eye thing, it has to be a certain distance from the back to work. And then in the back, there's little cells that take the light that they see. So if a little cell says, I see a little red, I don't know what kind of know they really say that, but, no, they don't. but anyway, so if it sees red, it tells the cell next to it, got red, and he tells the one next to it, and does that a thousand times, and you have thousands of cells, and they do that, and in the middle of a second, it comes up to your head, and I see everybody sitting there in different colors. And it's just amazing. But the thing is, what is it that makes those cells stick together kind of thing. Sometimes we don't think it's called light. In him is life. It's God Amen. is actually Amen. holding each cell together. If I yeah. cut myself, I don't say, okay, cell 321, <laughs> go two rights and left, and on your way out, it's a cut there, so grab onto something. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then I don't tell the other one to start reproducing. And, I mean, if, it, if we were an army unit, and something happened and we had to get supplies up to a part that got breached or something. I mean, that's a major undertaking if any of you have been in the Army. Like, if you've got a, a battle line and it, part of it gets breached, to take care of that is a big deal. I mean, lots of stuff has to happen, a lot of decisions, a lot of people, but we cut ourselves and we don't even think about it. And it just starts healing. That's because God is doing all that. Amen. And we can't hardly comprehend that. All our cells are hooked together because God's doing all that. Amen. This DNA that we have, it doesn't, uh, it's just a blueprint. Somebody has to read it. Yes, amen. And so we have those kind of eyes, but these are bug eyes. And uh, they're totally different. But God made a lot of things similar for similar things, but different for other things. And so when I see a lot of animals with two eyes in the front, now think if your eye was off a little bit, you wouldn't have depth perception or anything. You know, it, I mean, it, it's amazing when you really think about it. Another one that's amazing to me is the sound. I mean, we only hear a rate set. So let me, let me ask you, is this making a sound? It's not making a sound that we can hear, but it is making sound. It's making a wave in the air. We can't hear it until it goes a certain speed, and then it goes, and then we can't hear it anymore. That's why we can't hear the radio waves going through. Now, last time, they're all in the air, but we can't hear. We can only hear a little range. Now, what's really amazing is this little range that I could hear, I also have this voice box. You know what range it makes? That little range. 
And I can change and flex the voice box and my tongue and mouth and all these openings and make words without even really thinking about it. And I can sit up here and talk fast, faster than you can sign. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so anyway, uh, but what I'm saying is, all this, we, we don't understand sometimes, I, I think it's way over comprehensible, that, I mean we can't even comprehend how God is holding us together and the chair and everything. I mean it's just, it's amazing to me. And we think sometimes that he can't take care of our problems. You know? But uh, anyway, so uh, it's kind of, the DNA, one of the interesting things about DNA, it's like having a blueprint, so it's a blueprint of a jet engine, and it flies, it has a zipper in the middle and took half off, because that's what happens, half goes from the uh, male and half from the female, and they come together, and they make a new set, and that set is different, and there's millions and millions of options, so what happens is when, but a lot of them don't have options, right, like eyes and stuff, but the ones that do, they have a lot of options. Anyway, they come together and they make a new person. That's a little bit of an issue, you know, I don't know where you are, well, like abortion. You talk about that, as soon as it comes together, the DNA is a new set of DNA that's not anywhere else. It has, that baby already has its own fingerprints, its own everything. It's, it's a living being. Amen. And uh, the mom's taking care of it till then. And, uh, I don't want to get on that too much, but you know, uh, one of the sad things is I, I know two ladies that have had uh, abortions. My sister's one, and both of them have a lot of PTSD. And from I mean, it's a traumatic thing because, well, you know, anyway. Um, and I know another lady uh, who was going to, and she didn't. And her and her daughter have the closest relationship. I mean, it's amazing because they know that that second her mom said, you know what, I ain't doing it, she walked out, um, it's just good. But you know, a lot of this too, I don't even know what I'm going on this, but uh, if somebody gets raped or something, what, really what you have is two victims there. You need to deal with two victims. Anyway, I don't know. But anyway, so the zipper thing, so if you uh, have a uh, deal, and, and you have to basically take half from each one, it's like a zipper. It has to fit back in. And so that's why they have to be after their own kind. One, like, uh, if you have dogs and cats, you're never going to have a dog cat or whatever. You have dogs or cats because the DNA, the zipper, if you unzip the coat and stuck another coat that's exactly the same, you can zipper it up. If it's not the same, you can't zipper it up. Well, the other thing is, if one of the zipper things breaks, sometimes you can get it zipped up but um, it's not going to work very good. Or most of the time, you can't even get it zipped up. Well, that's kind of what God's done with, like, uh, because they say, well, mutations and stuff. But if you, if anybody's farmers here, you know that when an animal, you have an animal that's, like, got a mutation in it, usually they're, what? Sterile. And that's why, because the zipper won't zip anymore. They can't make, they can't do that. So what I'm saying is the whole thing with this evolution thing a bunch of genes would have to have, I mean, it doesn't even make sense to me, like feathers. Feathers are so complicated, really. They're so light, and I mean, they can come apart, and you know, you can just preen them and zip it back together, and all this stuff. And I don't know if you know, but we got chickens, and so to keep them from flying over the fence, all we do is cut three feathers, and they can't fly. Just three feathers, and they can't fly. If that's how precise this thing has to be. You know, we can't even make something like a feather and make it fly. I mean, it's so out of our, it's out of our league. But anyway, the, so this whole zipper thing is kind of important because we have the ability to adapt, but we cannot have genes change. For example, if I would have a gene for feather, feathers, uh, not only do I need a gene for a feather, but I need genes for feathers in the right places, and I need genes that tell me how big each one's got to be, you know. Um, if I don't have those genes, there's no, no possible way to even theorize how they could get in my gene pool. There's no way. It's impossible. And uh, not only 
the other thing is, what I was saying before, the DNA is just a blueprint. They take the blueprints and then they have to have something like this to put a plane together, and a plane is nothing compared to the human body. I mean, if you think about it, they can make things that shoot uh, baseballs, right, real fast, like a person can throw it, but that thing can't get up and go make breakfast or, you know, go walk around and get something to eat, or, I mean, you can't do any of that. In fact, they have trouble making machines that walk on two legs. And we don't even think about it. We got acrobats doing all this stuff, you know? And, uh, the, I mean, the, we, we look at this stuff sometimes and we can't see how awesome God is, yeah. you know? But um, the last one I want to talk about here, and then I want to get to something else a little bit, but it's like breeds of dogs. So what we've talked about now is there's ways that God has made for things to adapt and change. But there's other things that can't change, and you can't add anything into it. That's why we have breeds of dogs. Because what they've done is they've taken the things that can change, and they've bred them so that they can only have one thing. And they breed it all the way down to, like, a German Shepherd. But along the way, what happens is a lot of times the German Shepherd will have, or different breeds have anxiety problems or all these other things. A German Shepherd, they have hip problems. And that's because that's when you breed it down like that, where there's no more options, that's what you get. And so they're going to have that. So what people do now is to get a really good dog is they'll breed two, like a Labrador and a Poodle. So then you get a Labrador, right? I don't know if you'll track with this, but what happens when you get a Labradoodle is you refresh the gene pool. So now there's a lot more options than the Labradoodle in there. So if you take one Labrador, so if you take a Lab and a Poodle, you get a Labradoodle. If you take a Labradoodle and a Labradoodle, yeah. you get whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, because there's too many options now. And so the whole thing with breeding, to me, proves that there is absolutely no way to evolve. Otherwise, it would keep going, right? But I can't even comprehend the way how that could possibly happen in my life. And uh, so we look at animals. So we got now we got animals, and uh, we got people, and we're reading Genesis, and it's like, so what are we what are we doing here? You know, I mean, we got God made all this stuff, and I want to go to uh, back to Genesis. You want to turn to Genesis chapter? Uh, Two. Um, I'm gonna talk about Adam and Eve here for just a minute. And so we know that uh, uh, the Lord God He planted a garden, right? And one of the things with the Garden of Eden, so we know that um, during Noah's time, the earth was uh, beautiful. One of the ways I know that it was beautiful and it was, it was lush is because we have all the coal, all the oil. What is coal and oil made out of? Plants. And there's lots of it, right? And uh, I believe all the fossils and all the fossil record and stuff was created during the flood. That's all, that's why they call it sedimentary rock, right? It means flood sediment. That's what all that rock is. And so you get these layers of coal and layer and and oil in there, and that tells, and plus, I don't know, when I was a kid, we lived in Colorado, and there was lots of fossils. And I mean, everything was bigger, and uh, the plants, and everything, everything. And you see all the animals, and all the stuff, and it was bigger and better. And in fact, during the, before the flood, how long did people live? A thousand years, well, not quite, but it was close, right? And then after the flood, it went to drop way down. Well. Before the flood, there was a water vapor barrier around the earth also, and it was it was a nice place to live. High oxygen content, all kinds of stuff that would make it really nice. But I want you to know something. Eden was better than that. It was it was like it was it. Yeah. It was a place to be. And <laughs> so, but so it says, uh, actually I'm gonna read this in chapter two, verse seven. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground or and ate. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward of Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, 
and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Why? So let me actually let me read two more verses, and then we'll talk about that. In, look in 15. It says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. All he's got to do is mow the lawn with it. Yeah. the bushes. There you go. Eat fruit. I mean, and it's better than anything we ever had. And and uh, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. A couple things here. He didn't explain, okay, this is why you can't eat this tree, blah, 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 blah. He said, nope, eat it, you die, right? And well, why did he put it, why did he put that there? I mean, here we are in this beautiful place. If he leaves the tree out, we're good to go. But he put this tree in there, and he says, don't eat anything out of this tree. And then we go to chapter 3. And it says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. What does the word subtle mean? So I looked it up, I found a really good definition. It says, in one of the dictionaries, it said, it's when, uh, it's a copy of something that's so close to the original, you can't hardly tell it. Hmm. That's only versions today. But anyway, <laughs> it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, He shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And I'll tell you what, Satan hasn't come up with new plans for deceiving people. He just does the same thing over and over and over. And one of the things he says is, Yea, he gets you to doubt God's word. If you, if you doubt God's word, how can you have faith, right? And so, um, anyway, it says, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the garden, of the, of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. That's all God told him. Don't eat it or you're going to die. You know, it kind of reminds me of my grandson. Uh, or my, my granddaughter, actually, the other day, we were in the parking lot, and I told her, I said, listen, you have to hold my hand. I know you're little, but you can't understand. The cars can run you over. She wants to run around the parking lot and run to the door. I said, you can't do that. And so I even took her, and I took her, I bent down, and I said, see, you can't see the mirror, and I talked about the backup lights and all this stuff, and she's like, yeah, yeah whatever. And then she went to take it out, and I said, whoa, 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 you can't do that. You have to hold my hand. And I said, I know you don't understand this, but you have to hold my hand when we're in the parking lot. She can't comprehend it. And what would be terrible is if she saw a little kid get run over. I mean, that would be terrible. And then she would say, give me your hand, you know? But uh, she can't see that stuff. And we don't see the end result of a lot of stuff. But God says, you know what? I don't want you to do this. And we don't understand. And we need to just say, okay, man, man, man. man. And what does he call that stuff? Sin, right? Because sin always hurts us, takes us farther than we want to go, costs us more than we want to pay, keeps us longer than we want to stay. Amen. So, yeah, uh, amen. So anyway, here she is. She's saying, oh, you know, this and that and the other. And God said, don't eat it. So we don't eat it. And then look what it says. And God, uh, and the servant said unto the woman, "Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day they eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and shall be as God, knowing good and evil. And uh, anyway, then, it's kind of funny because, you know, First John says, what, the three things that Satan kind of gets you with, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But look at here. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh, that it was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and a tree that desired to make one wise. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Satan does the same thing though all the time with us. But anyway, so then I'm going to skip a little bit. She goes and she eats the, the, the fruit. And they're walking through the cool of the garden, the Lord is, and he says, actually, I want to read it. <laughs> so, um, well, I don't know. So anyway, they're walking through the cool of the garden, and the Lord says, Adam, where are you? 
Did he not know where Adam was? No, he knew where Adam was. Yeah. <laughs> and Adam says, well, we're over here. We hit ourselves. And uh, so then he says, what did you do? And Adam says, well, it's that woman you gave. <laughs> she made me eat that thing. And then the wife, uh, Eve says, well, it's that snake. He made you do it. And so God caused, uh, so if we look here, uh, actually we're in 15, is the verse, it's the prophecy, right? About it shall bruise his head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. He, he punches the snake, but here's what I want to get to. And then he says unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy, in thy conception, and thy conception. In sorrow shall thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So wait a minute. So he put this tree in the garden. Because why? He wanted them to trust him. He didn't explain it. He said, trust me on this. You don't want to eat that. And they said, eh, let me try. You know? And so now he's saying, okay, you didn't do so good with that. That was a little one. We're going to back it up now. We're going to be a little bigger problem. Because he wants them to trust him. Yes. Amen. Amen. And so, uh, in fact, I think it's that simple. That's what God wants us to do. He just wants us to trust him. Amen. And so, it's funny because Eve convinced her husband to take her back. Um, so, this is my own opinion. So, if the women get mad at me, but uh, um, I think what happened is she was actually better at being the boss. And she told him what to do. And the Lord said, I know you're going to struggle with this. So now you are going to have to listen to your husband. Because that's going to be hard for you. And you think about it. They're supposed to, wives are supposed to submit. It doesn't mean that men are way smarter. In fact, I think God just did the opposite. He said, listen, you can have it. But now you're going to have to be submissive. And think of it. Remember Sarah. Sarah and Abraham are going along and and then this king, is the, the guys that he's all worried that they're going to kill it because Sarah is so pretty. So he says, okay, well, here's the plan. I'm going to tell them you're my sister. Sarah, I bet she went in somewhere and was banging her head on the table there <laughs> and going, Lord, you want me to submit to this guy? You better take care of him. But see, what's the Lord want us to do? He wants the women to trust him. Amen. And then what did God do? He took care of it. In fact, the, the uh, king rebuked Abraham for it. Amen. And so, so I think, it is, you know, women are supposed to submit to, but they need to trust God. Sure. But then he told the man. Uh, so, and you know, when you think about that, and it says that the desire will be to the man, and that makes a lot of sense to me because I deal a lot with the jail people and stuff like that. I preach in the jails and missions. And there's so many women that are battered women, and they just won't leave the guy. And it's beyond, uh, I mean, reason. It's like, what are you thinking? In fact, if cops go to a, a scene, the most dangerous one is the uh, home domestic, the domestic violence. Because he can be beating up the wife, they'll pull him off and cuff him, and she'll beat him on the head with pot, you know? I mean, well, a frying pan or something. It's just because I believe that's why God just did that because He wants them to trust Him, Amen, above everything. And then He told the man, He said, uh, "In fact, I want you to go to Ecclesiastes uh, three. Keep your finger here. We'll be right back. Actually, I got it right there. But... And you, you're familiar with this verse, I'm sure. It says, "To everything." There is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. So, to everything, which is everything, there's a season. What's a season? The season is the period of time, right? So I can say to everything there's a time, and to every time there is a purpose. And a purpose, and God has set a purpose for everything and every time. And the purpose is that we would have, it would cause us to have faith in Him. In fact, that's what it says in 3.10. I've seen the travail which God had given to the sons of men. And he's talking about, I believe, right here in Genesis. 
to be exercised in it. What does it mean to exercise? To work like if you do, if you go to the gym and exercise, you're working your muscles, right? In fact, when I go to the gym, those guys, the way that they get stronger is they, like if they're doing a bench press, they press until they have what? Well, muscle failure. And they have the other guy spotting him, and he's going, come on, come on, come on. And then he'll help just a little bit. And what they actually do is they go until their muscles fail, and then they push that last little bit. And then the next time they come back, they're stronger. I believe God takes us to faith failure. And then we, when we get there, he can make us stronger each time. And, uh, you know, I used to think he was the God of the 11th hour. Because he always seems, for me anyway, he waits till the last second. And sometimes I've even given up. But then I was reading about Lazarus, and you know what? He's the God of 1230. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> he waits way after the 11th hour sometimes, so don't give up, you know? And uh, Amen. <laughs> um, well, I do have to say, I do want to tell you a story about a car I bought. So I don't know anything about cars. I had to buy this car one time. And so well, I'm, I'm going to cut the story a little shorter. But So I, I said, Lord, I don't know anything about cars. I'm going to go down and look, and uh, I'll pick what I think is right, and you'll have to help me. And what I'll do is I'll bring my wife, and if she says, I love that car, then I'll know that's the car, and I'll get it. You know, that sounds good. I mean, we got to, I believe God would do that, because he wants us to have, you know, stuff. i got to get around to work and everything, take the family around. So anyway, I did that, brought the wife in, and she said, I love that car. I mean, exact words. I was like, wow, okay, this is it. So I bought it, and it's a little four-cylinder. We had a big van with a 460 in it. And so we got this little four-cylinder. It doesn't seem to run that good, but I mean, that's that's a lot of difference in engine. And so, no big deal. So anyway, we're driving around. We're driving to Colorado, and I mean, this thing is not, not working. And uh, we're going up that hill, the one that comes out of Salt Lake. It's real long. And uh, we're going up that hill, and this car is barely making it. And I got me and my wife and my daughter. And then a car goes by the same year with a little rack on top full of people pulling a little trailer. And I'm like, something is wrong with this car. <laughs> so I pull over, and, and oh, and when I went to get the car, I said, Lord, uh, help me pick out a good one, and help me pay for it soon. And uh, so anyway, um, I lifted up the hood, and this guy comes over, what's the matter with your car? I go, I don't know, food. I'm just looking for a wire off or something. And uh, he's like, well, my brother's the best mechanic in, in Wyoming. I'll call him and you can bring it in and roll. So we're going that way. I said, okay. So we dropped it off. He looked at it, went through it, found all kinds of stuff wrong with it. Couldn't make it work. And so he only charged me like 80 bucks for parts, new plugs and all this stuff. So, okay. So I get to Colorado where we're going. My dad delivers car parts. He says, these guys in the Springs here are the best mechanics ever. They can fix it. I took it in there. They said, yeah, we'll fix it. Went to pick it up and they said, you know, I, I don't, we don't know what's the matter with this thing. Uh, so we're only going to charge you, it was about 80 bucks again, for parts. And I thought, you know, Lord, what's going on? And I, I mean, I did pray, and I thought, well, God gave me this car. And so when I'm driving home, and my brother, uh, he's given me a, he's got a lot of money, he does real well. And uh, um, he's giving me a hard time about, I need to buy a new car. You know, let me, let me go buy you a real car. And so I'll take you down. So anyway, I'm coming home, and we go through this hail storm. Knocks out a headlight, dings all over the car, every piece of trim is ding. And I pull in there and my brother is just laughing. And uh, so anyway, I got the new headlight and I'm, and he's like, tomorrow I'm gonna take you down and buy a real car. And I said, oh. And that night I was praying and I, I thinking, and it's like, you know what? Either God answered my either God's a God that answers prayers or he's not. So either I need to keep this car or give up on God, basically. And so I told him the next day, I'm keeping the car. So we got 12 miles a gallon in this little four-cylinder four car all the way back to Oregon. <laughs> and it's not running at all. I mean, I'm just like, oh. And I got my knees again. I said, because I, I called this guy. He says, yeah, well, for 800 bucks, we'll tear the thing apart and see if we can figure it out. And I thought, well, no, we're not doing that. And uh, uh, so I went and I kneeled down and I prayed. And I said, Lord, I know you know what's the matter with this. I know you know somebody here knows what's the matter with this. I'm just going to go talk to some people and you'll have to take care of it. Because i, I got to get this thing fixed. And uh, so anyway, I, I went to this place and I explained to the guy what's the matter, the owner what's the matter, and this uh, guy was, one of the mechanics was taking a coffee break. Still got his coffee cup and he goes, 
looked out the door and he said, is that your car right there? I said, yeah. He goes, sit down. And I gave him the keys and about 10 minutes later he goes, come here, I got shoes on. Well, what it was, is the 83 and Hondas, they tie across the top of the block. But that, that car, for some reason, had a little arrow one notch down. And so the timing was off one notch and they took it at a distributor and they ground it out so you could almost turn it all the way up 180, you know, to make the car run. And so he put that back on right, turned the thing back, put everything back, charged me 60 bucks, and that thing went out like a sports car. In fact, the whole rest of the time I had it, I didn't do a thing to it. And uh, got good mileage after that and everything. And I'm all excited. I'm driving this thing around. And I go to the old insurance guy to finish up all the paperwork stuff. He's like, I mean, I had insurance and everything, but we've got to finish everything up. I drive in there and he says, what happened to your car? I said, well, I got went through a hailstorm. He goes, well, that's covered. I said, really? So he totaled the car and I bought it back for 200 bucks. So I sort of, so it was less than a month. The car is paid for. It's been gone through by the best mechanics ever. And, but what if I would have gave up in Colorado? You know, we give up at the, at the you know, we get, ah. Yeah. And so, yeah, but what happened is when he pushed me a little bit on that one, then I have bigger trials, and it's like, no, he was ever that car. And I know he's just playing with me now. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be there. It ain't 1230 yet, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so, uh, um, anyway. So that's what I was talking about. The reason that God gives us travail or trials and struggles is to exercise us Amen. in faith. And so we'll go back to Genesis here. And in 17 there, it says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of the wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herd of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, until thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And what he's saying here, uh, he's given us some struggles. But the reason he's giving him the struggles is he's saying, Adam, you can't do this without me. You need to trust me on stuff. You need to call on me. You need to ask me when you have troubles. And, uh, and so the whole purpose of all this struggle that we get, in fact, if you, uh, I don't know if that's on my slide there. No. Go to uh, Romans chapter 5. Almost done here. The reason this one hit me is because I was telling Pastor McKenzie that I can't remember memorize anything. And I was working at the mill, had all this time on my hand. And he said, I said, I can't remember my name. And he's like, oh. And so finally I said, okay, uh, I'll try to memorize something. What do you want me to memorize? And he said, Romans. I said, like, which verse? He's like, you got time. <laughs> I did get up through chapter 8, but uh, uh, anyway, what's amazing is when you memorize stuff like that, this is kind of off a little bit, but it's stuff that sticks with you forever. It is so good to do that. But anyway, this one here, when I memorized this one, it changed my life. Verse 3, it says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Yes. Amen. Glory, when you look at glory, like in Genesis there, when he's first, talk, first talking about it, Jacob comes out, and he's got all of Laban's kids and grandkids and everything. And Laban's sons finally catch up to him, and they say, hey, uh, Jacob, you took all of Laban's sons, all of Laban's daughters, his grandkids, all his sheep, all that. I mean, he took everything. And then they said, you took all of his glory. Glory is basically... Everything is not actually us. So the things that we do, um, I had a construction business of bathrooms and kitchens I did, those are my glory, and you know, stuff like that. Now those are all, what kind of glory? Those are all vain glory, right? Mm -hmm. Wood, hay, stubble. But there's other glory that's good, like when we have faith. And uh, so anyway, it says here that glory 
of a Christian is what? Tribulations. Tribulations, that's right. I heard somebody whisper that. <laughs> <laughs> struggles and trials. How we go through trials and struggles is the glory of a Christian. Do we whine? Mm. We trust God. <laughs> Amen. It's real easy to say, you know, I'm going to trust God. But what happens, I, I believe the whole rest of your life, things happen. Like, just when I was, I was kind of, so I go to the jail and I talk to these two guys. And uh, we talk through the glass and stuff. And I was getting ready to go and I was doing this thing. And then the, the projector wasn't working and this wasn't working. And nothing was working. And it's like, I got to leave in a half an hour. And I told my wife, I said, you know, I'm going to have to cancel the jail tonight. And she said, and I praise God, you know, uh, women are great. Anyway, she said, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> and really what she was kind of saying is, no, God's still on the throne. You don't need to do that. That's what he wants you to do. Go do it. And as soon as I said, I'll do it. It's like, click, 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 click. Everything just went. And I was even ready before I even left the jail. I, I, was, I mean, it was amazing. I thought it was going to take me three hours to get it all fixed up and working, and it just went click, 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 right after I decided. Now, I, don't, I really believe that if I wouldn't have decided that, it had been 10, 30, 11, I'd still be messing with the computer. Uh, but, um, and even when I was in the National Guard, I was an acting first sergeant for a while, and so at the end of Sunday, we had to always have everything ready and done. Well, we never were. 4.30 would come around and everything's messed up and so you have to assign these guys to do this and that through the week, get everything done for the next girl. And then um, I just become a Christian and I finally told them, I'm going to go to chapel service today. I'm going to do it. They said, oh, you can't do that. And uh, so, and then when I got ready to go, obviously Satan does stuff, right? Well, we got a meeting. You got to be there. I'm going to the chapel service. Well, you can't do that. 3.30 that day, Everything was ready. People were all standing around. Every day, every Sunday that I took that time to go to the chapel service, we were always ready by 3.34. If I missed for some reason, no, I can't do it today, we were never ready. And it was I, it was just God saying, you know what? I, I got this. You don't got this. I got this. If you want to try to do it, I'll let you. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. It's kind of like Martin Luther King. We're just, it's, you know, I remember reading a thing about him. I read some biography stuff, but he's a great guy. But anyway, one of the things he said, he, had, he used to pray for two hours, or an hour a morning. And uh, the guy came in one day and he said, listen, we got a really tight schedule today. I wonder if you could cut it short. Um, and he said, oh, man, if it's that tight, I'll have to pray for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, anyway. So I believe God gives us stuff uh, for struggles. And I want you to go to Hebrews uh, chapter 4. And the Bible says, let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. What is, when, when you hear the word rest, what do you think of? Yeah, everybody's like, Ugh. you almost fell asleep right there. But yeah. yeah, that's what it is. It's like this, a peace, a rest, you're relaxed, you're not, no anxiety, and all this stuff, and uh, that's what rest is. And God, give, God gives us this rest. Amen. And then look what it says in verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. He's talking about us Christians, unto them the Jews in the Old Testament. Remember the Pharisees, they knew it. I mean, they could quote the Bible here and there and everywhere. And, and they did all these things and they're all stressed all the time. And the Lord called them vipers and all that stuff. And he's saying, here he says... Uh, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith. And then the herd. We need to trust God. At, God put that in the garden, I believe, because he wanted them to just trust him. And they didn't. So he said, we're going to make it a little tougher. A little bigger. We, they didn't trust him. Caused the flood, right? And so in our life, I believe it's the same thing. The more we just give in and trust him, he just takes care of stuff. 
But when we keep fighting and we keep trying to do stuff on our own, he keeps messing. You know, I mean, it just doesn't work. I, I, one of the biggest struggles I had, for some reason, I've always had pretty good faith that big things happen. But not the little things. And uh, I've always had felt like I'm supposed to take care of the little things. God will take care of the big things. But then for a while, all the little things started going bad. And I'm like, ooh. Well, then I realized, you know what, God needs to take care of the little things. And what he'll do is he'll put you in spaces where you have to stop and go on it. But if we're too stressed and stuff, we don't think about it. That's why, it's, that's why we need to have fellowship, too. We need to have somebody to say, like my wife did, hey, God's still on the throne. Amen. 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 And he just need, oh, that's all you need sometimes. Because we're all going to get stressed. We're all going to get anxiety. We're all going to do that. But I know that once I started giving God the little things, even. And, I mean, they were stupid little things. Like, I remember one time, I, I got ready. And right after I prayed that, Lord, help me to give you the little things. I'm going along and I looked on my phone. I had a meeting at four. And then all of a sudden, boom, this other one comes up. I had two me I scheduled two people at four. I'm like, ah! you know, and I'm stressing all out. I don't know what to do. And uh, I thought, ah. so I just pulled over. Lord, you know, okay, you see what you see what I did here. You know what you're working with though. And uh, I just messed <laughs> this up. Can you fix it? And then I was thinking, you know what? He can't fix it. Oh, I just Thank you, Lord, for fixing it. And so I thought, well, I'll call this guy. So I call him, and he says, hey, I'm glad you called time about an hour late. Can I reschedule for about an hour later? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, and that's what always happens. It's, it's, it's amazing when you even give the little things to God. Um, uh, anyway, and so that's what I was saying about the mixed in faith. So I want to end this. So, um, well, here's one. So, but you know, gorillas aren't strong. Gorillas are strong because God made them that way, right? We need to be strong because God can do it. Yeah. We're not, we're not, we're not strong. But we can, just like David said, I can kill Goliath. Or he can say, I can kill Goliath. Saul said, what are you thinking? You're a little guy. He's been killing people since he was your size. You've never even killed anybody. You've never even fought anybody. There's no way you can take that guy. And David said, why? I killed the lion, and I killed the bear. And I believe what happened when he did the lion, he was at his wit's end, and he said, Lord, my dad's going to kill me. If I don't go get this sheep, please be with me. You know? And he didn't, I don't think it was like that. I think he just went and just trusted God and just did it. And then when he rescued and killed the lion and took the sheep, he's like, God can do anything. And then he killed the bear. And then so when Goliath comes along, he's like, you know, I know I can't do it. But God can. Amen. And so we need to have gorilla faith in a way that God can do it. Yes. Just like super strength, superhuman strength. The gorillas have superhuman strength. We need to have that kind of faith, just trusting God in everything. And uh, especially in 2020 with everything that's going on, right? we got all this stuff happening, and everybody's afraid of everything. And it seems like everybody I talk to, especially if they're not saved, they're really afraid of this whole thing. The media's got them really worked up. And uh, we know where we're going. And it's a good time to talk to people. And uh, I just did talk to a guy yesterday. I, was, I went and I had a cup of coffee because I couldn't and sit outside and just open their place up. This guy comes over, and we're talking. He's an English guy. I don't know if you know just that the humor is off. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, he's just like this guy drives by and he's talking to him, and, and I go by and go, Who is that? And he goes, I don't know. <laughs> right? You know, just, you know, harass the guys in the car. Anyway, but he was scared to death of this coronavirus. He, he almost, we almost couldn't talk because he was so mad about it and worked up. You're killing people, you know, we're asking. And I mean, just, you know, on and on. And, and you know, he's so afraid of dying. But I did say a few things and just kind of let it go. I didn't try not to argue with him, but um, I'm hoping that that will kind of work in a little bit. I see him off and on. So, uh, but anyway, um, what, what I, I want to end here with is we need to be this gorilla strong in 2020. And I'm talking about your faith. Amen. We just need to have a faith that's superhuman. Amen? Amen. Amen. Right. Pastor? 
All right, so I think the thing, the lesson was this, is that um, exercise pop with little. <laughs> exercise your faith instead of your muscles. You're never going to be as strong as a gorilla unless you, <laughs> unless you get it from the Lord. So.